Cause I did it my way, none of y'all can say In this life for the next one Watch me, I'm gonna be the best of I am what I am today Cause I did it my way, none of y'all can say This is Danny Brown, you're listening to The Deal And this week's interview, we have a really, really special opportunity uh, To talk to Daryl M. Blocker He is a retired, high, high level CIA operative clandestine operations, head of uh, many CIA divisions, including anti-terrorism, Africa, Middle East. He's recently retired and was just honored with the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal uh, on August 28th. He's an incredibly interesting guy, extremely smart, extremely humble, unassuming. Uh, He was chief of station chief of the African division, deputy director of counterterrorism, and just at the highest levels of CIA. So as an American and as a free Western world citizen, this is just such a rare opportunity. And out of respect for Daryl and CIA, some of the stuff can't be talked about. You will notice that some things are edited out uh, or blocked out in this episode uh, for obvious reasons. So anyway, enjoy it, sit back and take it all in. School is in session. You know what it is. This one goes out to my people. Yeah. Listen. I am what I am today because I did it my way. Central Intelligence Agency. Wikipedia says the Central Intelligence Agency is a civilian foreign intelligence service of the federal government of the United States tasked with gathering, processing, and analyzing national security information from around the world, primarily through the use of human intelligence. Is that accurate, Daryl? That is accurate. (laughs) Um, I don't understand why it's a mystery to people that the CIA is a clandestine service, that we're not out in the news, that we're not talking about who we are and what we're doing. It's classified. It's one of those things that if you don't need to know this information, there's a reason why you don't need to know this information. And people see that as you're hiding something. We yeah. are hiding something. Right. We're hiding <laughs> We're hiding our capabilities because guess what? If the CIA goes away, the rest of the world has intelligence services. They don't go away. We're already at a market disadvantage. Yeah. The intelligence community, um, as imperfect as it is, is keeping our nation safe. Sure is. Well, let's stop before we go further because we have a very remarkable human being here today, Daryl Blocker. Great guy, good friend. And thank you for coming and blessing us here today. I just want to read a few things from his storied career. Daryl had uh, just retired recently, a long storied career, the the CIA. Uh, Let me read a few things just so you guys have an idea of who we're speaking to. He was a member of the CIA's clandestine service, the directorate of operations, including nine years with the senior intelligence service ranks. He's been a military veteran with 22 years living and working abroad in Asia, Africa, Europe, South Asia for the CIA and the Air Force. Some of his titles just over the last decade include Chief of Station, Chief of Africa Division, Deputy Deputy Director of Counterterrorism Center, Chief of CIA's Iconic Operational Training Facility, and that's just some of the stuff you've done in the last 10 years, but we're going to get into a lot of this. But welcome to The Deal with Danny Brown, and thank you. And I think to get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what is the CIA, uh, maybe compared to what is the FBI, so people can just get a better understanding of the uh, what is the whole the world of intelligence and the world of military, just so we can break down the big pillars and where the CIA stands in that and what they focus on. Right. And then we could talk a little bit farther back about where you grew up and how you actually got to the CIA. But let's start with more of a broad education for all of us that don't know much about the military or the CIA or the FBI, what they all are, how they work together or don't work together. Right. Just a breakdown. So to understand who we are today, I think I should take you back to our roots. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. The response to that resulted in the creation of an organization called the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, William J. Donovan, who was our first director, was 
a World War One veteran, uh, Congressional Medal of uh, Honor winner, and at the time a Wall Street lawyer, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt re- basically said, you know what, this can never happen again, meaning Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So between 1942 and 1945, the OSS had... Um, had a training facility that was referred to as the farm and British SAS or MI6, which is their, uh, I guess their CIA equivalent, helped the United States stand up the first civilian intelligence service. In 1945, when the war ended, that was all the military elements that created the OSS went back to the army and the army air force became the United States air force. Between 1945 and 1947, they were still trying to figure it out. And they're like, listen, this is an intelligence service and it did good work. And let's see if we can keep it around. The National Security Act of 1947 created the CIA, the National Security Council, the NRO and the um, uh, the United States Air Force. So between 1947, that's the roots, the beginning of of CIA between 1945 and 47. It was called the Central Intelligence Group. Okay. Anyway, I just needed to kind of set the stage That's for that. That's where it started. Right. And in agreement with other institutions within the Defense Department and at the time um, uh, State Department came this group known as, as CIA. Between 1947 and probably when I joined in 1990, you know, the CIA doesn't have the best of reputation for people who don't serve and work at CIA because we don't talk about who we are, about what we do. Right. And we just need to get the job done. We do it behind the scenes. We do it quietly. But every single, every single treaty that you've ever seen negotiated, the CIA was somewhere in the mix. Every um, political leader around the world understands that the CIA is there and they have their own intelligence services. So we're not the boogeyman. We're not perfect. Uh, we're just folks out there trying to stop the worst of things from happening. And that's, that's what I did. Yep. Now, the CIA has five directorates. Up until about three years ago, there were only four. But Director John Brennan, former director, created a sent, uh, directorate of uh, a cyber basically cyber, just to come up to today's standards. But those five directorates are operations, science and technology, uh, uh, support, intelligence, and now the cyber. Cyber. So the cyber one was cleaved out of the existing uh, science and technology, the CIA's Q branch, and the directorate of operations. Now, the directorate of operations my home component is the one that movies and books and TV shows are based on. That's the James Bond. That's the James stuff. Bonds. That's the Jason Bournes. Bonds, yeah. That's the Homelands. And fine entertainment. I love the entertainment. But not at all anywhere close to being accurate about who we do. So CIA. <laughs> How about that? CIA, Hollywood isn't realistic? I know. <laughs> shocking. Shocking. I know. So they call us CIA operatives. That's a term that I'm not used to or comfortable with, but it's one that translates to folks outside of our business. Yeah. I am not a spy. I recruit spies. And the difference is CIA agents are our spies are our assets. They're the people who help us. They're the people in Afghanistan. They're the people all over the world who partner with our officers in the field to help stop, to keep things abroad and don't let those things uh, reach the um, the homeland. So and are speak. those people that you're, you're they're CIA agents? Right. Are those people American citizens or these are international? Or it could be anything. So the people who work within within the CIA, of course, you have to be an American citizen in order to to join CIA. But our partners. Right. who are doing this clandestinely, meaning their countries don't know about it, doing it, are every citizen that you can think of on the planet, wherever the need is. Wherever in, the, is. in the real estate business, it's location, location, location. Right. In the human intelligence or human business, it's access, access, access. And what that means is, does that person have access to the information that we don't know about? 
that we need, that's the more attractive they are. The closer you can get to that inner circle, um, the easier it is to try and get the best and most relevant um, information. Just quickly, if if I could add a kind of an example, uh, about a month ago, the brother, uh, half brother of Kim Jong Un, the current leader of, of North Korea, who was killed a couple of years back, there was a story about he was a CIA agent, and then. Some of the writers were like, well, why would he be, he be important? He didn't live inside of North Korea. He lived outside. I don't know whether he was an agent or not, but because he was the brother, that in and of itself would have made him important. So if you look at KJU or Kim Jong-un as the, as the bullseye in the target yeah. and then rings outside that or his close, intimate, personal or family friends, that's where the, bro- the half-brother yeah. fell in. Yeah. So that in and of itself would mean, yes, he probably is. Uh, important, but that's the access point that yeah. I wanted to as close to as cover. you can exactly. get to the exactly. source. Exactly, and these people are being paid. I assume that's it's, they're, they're, that's why they do it. They're, you know, there's the the common wisdom is that people um, decide to work for CIA for the money. I have found in my own personal experience, and I spent 28 years uh, chasing North Koreans and Russians and Chinese all over the all over the globe. Um, Recruiting some, recruiting and setting up uh, spy networks, and most people do it for the same reason that I do it, a sense of adventure. Yeah. The money is there. The money is not necessarily the, the only thing that people it's do. It's not the only drive. Um, people do it because they want to right wrongs, and they're in a system where they're born on the wrong side of the track. They're born into the wrong tribe. They're born into the wrong gender, depending on where you, where you happen to be. And they're born into systems that are that are not just. And they recognize that there's only so far they're going to be able to go. They don't agree with maybe the way that their government is doing some things. Mm-hmm. And we we're trained to find those people. We're trained to look at the vulnerabilities, the motivations, who Got within it. this group of five in this room are going to be that one person most likely to feel sidelined marginalized or willing to hmm maybe i will entertain and accept this guy's uh invitation to dinner i want to see where he's going with this yes and the and the targeting process isn't of course it can't happen as quickly as it does in the movies a developmental process meaning i have identified this individual as the most likely and it's a back and forth all the time between the field and headquarters and um we don't operate for the sake of operating. We are, we are beholden to a, a, uh, an operating directive, meaning here's the five things that you're going to be interested in. Here's the five things that every station and base around the world is going to, is going to go after. Again, look on the front page of any newspaper in the world. And those are probably the issues that the CIA is also interested in. And, and again, internationally, Domestic, we have no, uh, and and you asked about our difference from the FBI. The National Security Act of 1947 was very, very clear. They had the Germans and the Russians as as a blueprint for how not to set up an intelligence service. They did not want the CIA to have arrest authorities. They did not want the CIA to be a law enforcement. They did not want the CIA to be able to monitor Americans, and we do not do that. Despite everything that you might hear or read or see, the CIA does not monitor Americans. Quite frankly, we don't care about the Americans other than the fact, can they get us closer to this target that we're interested in? That's it. Yeah. And FBI, they're Correct. a federal-based agency, right. I assume. Right. So what would be the difference if someone says, well, where where does the line stop for the CIA and begin for the FBI? Is it just U.S. versus international? Right. What what are some of the big differences for us? Well, in, in, in today's world where everything is, um, you know, the world is shrinking. People say the world is, you know, it's, it's a small world. Yeah. and And it really is. Everything that is domestic might have an international nexus to it. So the domestic arm of the Directorate of Operations within CIA is a division called National Resources. National Resources, so the, so 
there is a domestic presence of mm -hmm. CIA within the United States, but in complete partnership with the FBI, local, state and federal law enforcement, and of course our, our other intel communities. So CIA is one of 16 members of the IC or intelligence community. Our focus is human intelligence, human. Yeah. And the CIA only does three things, by charter, by law, since 1947. Three things, that's it. Listen closely. Yeah, let's hear it. Listen Foreign in. intelligence, meaning the collection of intelligence. Intelligence might just be information, but it's that information that the government wants you not, the foreign government wants you not to have. That's what we go after. After collection is analysis of that. Now analysis isn't just of human, it's of the all the ints, all the intelligence. NSA is sig SIGINT, or signals intelligence. There's a piece of that. There's OSINT, which is open source. What people write in their in their manifestos, what people print in their local newspapers, what Al-Qaeda said after its failed attempt against the World Trade Center in 1993 was, we're going to come back and we're going to blow it up. So you can't just dismiss that because it's out there in the public fora. Yeah. You have to consider that. So that's what our analysts do. So collection, analysis, and then the third part is the one that always gets the CIA in trouble, and it's called covert action. Mm -hmm. Covert action belongs solely within the purview of the President of the United States. Covert action is not something that comes out of the CIA. It's in response to a direct, um, from, the a direct from the President, here's what we're interested in. And I'm not sure that these st statistics are, are, um, are still accurate, but most people wouldn't think that Jimmy Carter was at one point responsible for more um, covert actions than any other president. That includes Reagan, all the Bushes, and up through Obama. I don't know what the current president has done since then, yeah. but most people would not associate James Earl Carter, you know, I'm a Georgia boy, so he's my president, as wanting to be involved in, in covert action, but that's the president's purview. Yeah, got right. it. So three things, collection, That's analysis, it. Simple. covert action. It really is that simple. Do we have to check our phones? Our phones aren't bugged, nothing like that. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. So there's so many interesting topics to cover. Um, I'd love to hear your take on 9-11, what you can tell us about it and what you, whatever you what it can be speak about it. But since it's such a uh, massive, devastating moment in our history and was, it was such a big part of, you know, I'm, I assume such a big part of the intelligence community right. uh, and on their radar. I'd just love to hit your take on, you know, before what you guys knew about it or didn't know about it uh, and, and after and now what you guys are, are focusing on. Right. So I, I had a classmate from the farm who was in the Pentagon and lost his life. I had friends that lost their lives in the twin embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. I have friends who died uh, in Afghanistan. So 9-11 isn't just another another day yeah. to me, and it really shouldn't be another day to, to anyone. It changed the entire world. Al-Qaeda was dead, you know, like we come in and we clock into work, whether you physically clock in or not, you know, nine to five, that's your job. Their job every day was to try and figure out how to end the Western, you know, meaning the United States, grip on, you know, on the world. Coca-Cola, uh, Levi's, whatever it is that, you know, goes beyond our border that everybody can associate with. Al-Qaeda wanted to put an end to that. And they did a really good job of it. But what they also did was they coalesced the world against them. And people say, oh, it took you a long time to find bin Laden. It did. No question about it. But when one man doesn't want to be found, it's not easy to find one person. And plan. trust me, the entire world was with us trying to track him down. 9-11 um, was not so much a surprise to me, um, only because Al-Qaeda told us what they were going to do. When they failed in 1993, they came back and said, well, that's still our target. Now, there's a whole bunch of targets. Every day, there's a threat. So at what point 
you know, and it was eight years between the first attempt and the second one. After eight years of watching, at some point, yeah, we weren't talking to our partners in the Bureau and all that, you know, we can get into all that, but I think that's sometimes looking at it the wrong way. But 9-11, hopefully they'll never, everybody's waiting for the next 9-11. There's not going to be another 9-11. The ISISs of the world are more intent on shooting up, you know, small, you know, small groups. I won't say small. It's just not Twin Towers big um, stadiums in France, uh, train stations in Spain and in Belgium, um, you know, attacking our soldiers on the ground in, in Afghanistan, wherever it happens to be, these guys, that's their job. That's what they do all day, every day, is try to figure out how to kill an American. So how do we then come to grips and say, well, it's not going to happen again. As an average American, we all have that fear since 9-11 that this could happen any moment, whether you're in the theater, you're at the Dodger game, you're walking down the street, right. you're on an airplane, and we right. all walk around with that anxiety. Uh, and obviously, no one could read the future. No one has a crystal ball. But I'm curious an insider's take on why you feel that something like that may not happen again or, or, or the odds of that happening. Is it because we're more diligent? or Right. Well, and the odds of something at that magnitude happen again, I don't think is is feasible only because the world is now in partnership, not with just the eight. This isn't the CIA or the United States. Yeah. This is the entire world Bigger saying, yeah, this is real. We have to do something about this, whatever this means to you locally. Um, and the what I'd like to do is kind of turn that back on you and look at the underwear bomber and the shoe bomber. Yeah. So those were not stopped by TSA. Those were not stopped by the local police. Those were not stopped by the CIA. Those were not stopped by anybody except for the guy sitting an aisle back and an aisle over yeah. looking at Richard Reed trying to light his shoe on fire yeah. and saying, there's something wrong here. Yeah. And he stopped it. It might be the intelligence or law enforcement agencies that stop an attack, but it's more likely that an aware citizen who's concerned about the threats, who's concerned that knows that it's out there, that's going to stop them. The underwear that's bomber, a Nigerian, made it all, all he was going to blow up the plane over Detroit or on a flight from London to Detroit, if I, if I recall correctly. And again, a concerned citizen recognized something that just didn't seem right. That whole see something, say something, it's yeah. real. Yeah. The um, pressure cooker bomber that was along the route of a, I want to say a marathon. Um, they found, not the Boston one, but there was, a, there was another one. And somebody said, that just doesn't look right. And they stopped it. The truck in Times Square mm -hmm. that that didn't go off. A concerned citizen was like, this is something. We are all responsible for the safety. for the safety of the others around us. And we cannot do it alone. And intelligence failures happen. It's yeah. just that when they happen for the CIA, they hit the news. You don't hear the successes. You don't need to know what the successes are. It's a scary world out there. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it's scary. But it's less scary because we're communicating more within our intelligence community. We're communicating more with our foreign partners. And, and make no doubt about it, every time someone says something about, oh, those people in, and again, I'll just use Pakistan, Afghanistan as, as an example because that's an area of which I know well. When Americans are dying in Afghanistan, they're dying side by side with their Afghan partners. Afghans are dying, also fighting against Al Qaeda, fighting against ISIS. Every Got country it. that we're in, Iraqis are dying for Americans to keep yeah. that from happening. So don't lump all the people into one category. Yeah. So listen, I'm a Jewish guy, all right? And I lived in four Muslim countries. And I observed Ramadan in those countries because it was important for me to understand what Islam meant to the people of the countries that I was wow. living in. So. 
don't I don't think anybody is one thing and I don't think people are the worst of of their you know the one thing you shouldn't you shouldn't be known for the worst thing that's ever that's yeah. ever happened to yeah, you. and there's evil everywhere exactly you know, in every city around it, the world exactly. there's a few bad apples and yeah absolutely totally exactly. totally good well what sorry for your losses and of course thank you and all your associates for your service i mean that's you keep us and our family safe and it's been happening you know since this country has began but, right uh, now more intense than ever with this new new threat we live with so changing gears okay i'd like to go back to a younger daryl blocker six so pack would I, so would i bench pressing 300 pounds playing a little football georgia so, bulldogs so, go dogs uh, go dogs so let's talk about you were raised we were raised in georgia Is that um so my my father was military so i so grew, you grew up, up military. i grew up uh, i was born in key west grew up in the heel of the boot italy Okinawa, Japan, and then moved to Texas when I was nine. Military brat jumping right. around yep. um, internationally and domestically. Yep. Uh, two sisters and a brother and the six of us, with, or the four of us with our parents, um, moved around every couple of years. So the seven of my first nine years on the planet, I lived outside the United States. And I think what I got that travel bug. I yeah. got that, that sense of there's another world out there. There's another world out there that I'm really, really interested in. Um, and so I was in, I was a boy, I was a Cub Scout. I was a Boy Scout. I was ROTC in high school. I was ROTC Air Force at the University of Georgia. And then I became an Air Force officer and spent my, uh, uh, my career in Osan Air Base, South Korea. South Korea. And um, Austin, Texas, where my son was born, and then joined the agency in 1990. So I loved, I loved being around different languages and cultures, and I did speak Japanese at one point, but the Japanese population between Okinawa and Texas kind of dropped off, so I lost that, <laughs> lost that capability. And then the agency taught me French, and I lived in three Francophone, so French-speaking countries in Africa, and then also a, a francophone, a French-speaking country in Europe. So I'm a French speaker. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, just a quick sidebar: I was in a, I was getting a mani pedi yesterday, and <laughs> and I heard a woman, I heard a woman, a woman came in, and and I thought I heard French, and the uh, the Vietnamese ladies where I've been going for the last three years, turned to me like, they looked at me because they they've heard some of my stories, and so I was helping the lady who, I, but. Talking, talking about economics and politics and world events in French, I can handle that. Not so much on buffing and, <laughs> and, uh, and nails. So I was, I was, I was struggling a little bit, but it was, it was, it was, it was fun. Didn't know um, exactly with what colors. The right, French, right, 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 right. Exactly, style. exactly. That's fun. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. So I got a, Oh, so yeah. So I, I, I grew up moving around, and. I knew that as great as our nation was, that other nations are pretty cool too. Senegal was a fantastic place. Industrious, hardworking people, um, smart, um, innovative, and probably one of my favorite, favorite postings. Um, and almost everywhere I lived were I like to tell people I never had two bad days in a row in, um, in the agency. Now, I had a lot of shitty one days, and it, but if I added them up over my 28-year career, maybe they might add up to two to three months. And if anybody can say that about their job, I'd say they're in the right spot. I'd say so, although I have a sense that your shitty days – were a lot more intense and dark <laughs> than us oh, yeah, average. They, they, they uh, were bad. Our average ditch diggers over here that we. <laughs> oh, right. So is it just uh, a given that, as part of your job, it, it was risky and life is on the line and there was scary things and you did scary things, saw scary things, or is that not yes. so much the case? No, it was it's a given. That's just well, part of the job. So just to kind of give the uh, the listeners a. Kind of, I, I was undercover for 28 years. Yeah. So, but undercover doesn't mean FBI Donnie Brasco 
type mm-hmm. undercover where you're infiltrating the mafia yeah. or the Aryan nations or anything like that. It's it's not, not deep it's cover. not what the, no it's not deep cover. <laughs> My cover, of course, was was State Department. But now that I'm no longer in, under State Department, I can't tell people that I was a diplomat. So for 28 years, people said, "What did you do?" I'm a diplomat, and I was I did consular work. I was an econ officer. But that was my cover. That was the job that I did at the embassy that allowed me to be in in the countries that I lived in. But the real work was spotting, assessing, developing, recruiting spies to help our nation uh, keep one step of those who wish to do us harm. Um, Back to your question. What was your uh, original question? Just the risky scariness of it all. So, okay, I know where I was going. I... I came out from undercover when I re- retired in October of 2018 or 2000, yeah, 2018, last year, last, year, yeah. year, last fall. And what that meant was I went from never being able to say CIA to only being able to say that I'm CIA. And there's agreement between State Department. It goes back many, many years. Um, not that important, but it's Stasius 70, uh, Stasius. Stacia 77, State CIA Memorandum of Agreement, and that's the base, the basis of it. Anyway, it. I get asked all the time, was it dangerous? Yeah, it's dangerous. Espionage is against the law in every country on the planet by virtue of the fact that my job was to, to set up espionage networks. Yeah, it, those countries did not want me to be yeah, doing I what I was so. doing. I so yeah, it was dangerous, and I spent time on the ground in in Somalia in the aftermath of uh, Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down, wow! I spent time in Burundi after the Hutu Tutsi massacres. God. I spent time uh, running around in the Pakistan Afghanistan theater, and uh, these are these are not vacation spots. No. So yeah, it was, it was it was it was it was it was dangerous, but we're well trained. We're well trained and using your mind and your ability to connect with another human being is really, really becoming a lost art. And the CIA, particularly within the Directorate of Operations folks, and even the smaller niche of folks like myself, who are the op, op certified or the ones who, who um, you know, made it through the farm and were successful doing it. So it's dangerous, but you can't look at it as dangerous if 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 our law enforcement officials recognize how dangerous it was every day the fact that when they clock in they might not be able to clock out at the end of the day we'd never get anything done you can't let fear stop you from doing what needs to be done but i got shot at in a couple of places it wasn't personal i was uh i no seriously i i, I honestly look at i look at it that way i was in a country where I was seen as the, you know, the infiltrator, the bad guy. We're not the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. I but I, I am biased. Yeah. But I'm, but I, what, a part of what I'm trying to do right now, Danny, is adhere to the adhere to the promise that I made to the director when I left which was to serve as an ambassador at large for the CIA. The CIA treated me well. Yeah. My family, my son and my daughter grew up in other countries, only went to school in the United States one year. And my, my former spouse, um, all of them had a very rich and, and beautiful life because of what the CIA. So I'm really grateful. Provided a great I'm, life right, for you and your I'm, family. I'm, great, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful for that beyond words. So a part of why I'm even accepting doing podcasts is because there's so much that can be explained Mm -hmm. that doesn't need to be secret. The part that needs to be secret will stay secret. Yeah. But the fact that we have literally thousands of people out there whose only job every day is to keep us safe. That's it's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful and not always appreciated. There's no USO at airports Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no one from the agency who's ever got a first class seat because they weren't in uniform. You know, that happens to police. That happens to the military. And that's fine. We don't want um, to be known. But now I can be that 
that mouthpiece, so to speak. Yeah, it's a great And everybody's not going to agree with me. Um, I know it's not very uh, PC to quote uh, Bill Cosby anymore, but I did a, I did a lot of leadership and management training. And one of right. the one of the one of the lessons that I learned from him is an interview after the decades in the eighties where the show was the number yeah, one in the star in the world. Et exactly. And one of the one of the folks asked him, said, "Well, what's your secret to success?" And he had his you know big cigar. I think it was a cigar aficionado article, and he said, "You know what." I have no idea what the secret to success is, but the secret to failure is trying to please everybody. That stuck with me a lot. And it's important for people to understand that you don't have to please everybody. You have to be respectful. You have to have integrity. You have to have character. You have to have people who are willing to take the, take the bullets. CIA was designed to be the whipping boy of the administration. When something goes wrong, they need to say the CIA was responsible to protect the presidencies. And I'm talking about everyone from 1945 to Trump, okay? Yeah. That is our DNA. That's, that's what we do. I don't get upset when people portray the CIA, you know. Uh, I, I get upset when we're the always the worst person like literally every director or producer or actor that i've talked to i said if you could just create one program where the cia isn't the most the cia guy in your cast isn't the most the most despicable human being in the entire show that would be a start yeah that's where i come in yeah yeah so do we we got to spread that message you are an ideal ambassador of it very likable, I, I, very I, articulate. Everyone likes your stories. And it's such a power. Listen, spies have been around since Joshua Forever. and Caleb were yeah. sent by Moses ahead to spot out what's out there. Yeah. But here's a quote. Espionage or spying is the second oldest profession, but less reputable than the first. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what I get from that is selling your body is preferable to selling your soul. People think you sell your, your soul, soul when you join the CIA. Yeah, I didn't yeah. sell my soul. Yeah. I'm the same person that my parents raised to be a person of, uh, to stand up for those who can't stand up for yeah. themselves. My daughter is fighting on the streets of Chicago for the rights of everybody. I yeah. love that in that kid. Right. My son is doing the same thing in a different way in his writing. That's what I got from my parents. That's what I passed yeah. on to my children. And I can think of one very specific. I was at a historically black college and uh, college and university in Southern Virginia at a job fair. So I'm still an agency uh, for the recruiting center trying to spread the word. Here's what the CIA can offer you no matter what your background is. So I yeah. do some I do some of that. But there was this young man who just kept walking by walking by the booth. And I know he wanted to come up and yeah. talk, but there were he other people there. So anyway, it was a, it was a lull and I kind of waved him over. I said, come on over and, you know, Chat, talk to yeah. me. And he walks up and he looks at me and he's like, how can you work for them? Do you know that they did, they All did, the um, they did um, uh, experiments on black soldiers. And I said, yep. And we tried to kill Castro. And we mined the uh, the harbors of Nicaragua. I said all of that happened forty years ago. If you want to talk about forty years ago, I can talk history with you. But if you want to talk about the options that you have within the CIA, which are amazing, listen, it's the best life you're ever going to live. I'm telling you, if you like travel, if you like being around other people, if you have the stomach for it, and it's not easy. Moving every two to three years is not easy. I've moved every two to three years pretty much for the last 30 years. 
when I moved to when I moved to Santa Monica, it was my 22nd move since graduating college in 1986. Well, that is can, not for the faint of heart. We can keep you keep you here. Uh, for a while. yeah, Southern California <laughs> stuck with me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going. Do anywhere. you know when you go on these assignments that hey, it's a two year assignment, it's a three year assignment, yes. it's a four. Yes. So you know going in, it's so, not like your bag is packed every day and they go today's the day. Nope. Nope. Not at all. To uh, Germany. So the um, uh, we have the war zones, which are Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and there are a couple of others that might be in there now. Those are one-year assignments. Mm -hmm. All other assignments are two years with an option to stay for a third, and that's for people within the DO, the Directorate of Operations, yeah. also known as the National Clandestine Service. Same, same. Yeah. Um, so I knew that every two to three years, me and my family were going to pack up and move from, that's part of the you gig. Know, from Washington to West Africa, to North Africa, back to another country in West Africa, to East Africa, to Europe, and then back to Washington. So yeah. I was in the field for 18 years. Um, and then when you mentioned in the, 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 uh, the opening, the SIS, the uh, uh, Senior Intelligence Service, that's the general rank. So my last nine years at CIA, I went from a one-star to a three-star equivalent in uh in the military people yeah. understand stars yeah. so that's why i'm bringing that up um and so i moved from running agents and assets or sources all the same thing to managing the officers who were doing that so you know just working my way up the management yeah. chain and chief of africa division of course was that was my crowning that was my crowning moment because i grew up in africa division Got it. so just to step Amazing. back, graduated from graduated from college, went in the Air Force, and I talked about yeah. Korea, Texas, and then moving to moving to uh, Northern Virginia in 1990, with a four month old screaming all the way from Austin to um, uh, to Fairfax. It was brutal. Um, and then <laughs> my first three months were on the North Korea desk. So my my background is North Korea. Iran and terrorism, if I had to narrow it down to the yeah. three issues in which in which I'm, you know, subject matter expert is a term that the kind of the outside world, I don't consider myself an expert in anything. I'm probably close to an expert in, in human behavior and human motivations, which goes back to my uh, decision to, you know, to follow uh, psychology as a um, as an undergraduate. And then the practical application of, of uh, kind of like motivating. I sold the American dream. It's pretty easy to sell the American dream. That's what I sold. I was a salesman. Yeah. Um, but that sale, you know, that sales pitch was what we call an operational pitch. Will you, you know, Mr. North Korean, Chinese, or Russian, come work for me? Now, there's a whole bunch of things that go into uh, getting to that moment. But it's like you would never ask someone to marry you if you aren't pretty sure they're going to say yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing for delivering a, a recruitment pitch. And yeah, already, you have already aligned. You've already figured out that this is somebody that I can trust. And there's constant vetting. It's not like you say yes today and we're going to trust you henceforth now and forevermore. Yeah. Trust but verify is always right. one of those things. Right. Um Oh, oh yeah. I mean, relationships go every. You know, what is it? What is it? Fifty fifty on weddings. Um, I would I would say that <laughs> was the, it on, uh, I would I would CAA say operatives. that the, I would say that uh, the relationship. <laughs> I would say that the relationship between a CIA operative and the sources that they're running are far greater than fifty fifty, but only because. There's something about clandestinity. There's something about secrets. There's something about two people working together for a common cause that is uh, is powerful. Whether you're you know in a foxhole next to somebody else, yeah. or you've gone through training, or you've gone through grad school, or you've gone through medical school, whatever it happens to be, that brings people that brings people together. And the assets that are that are helping us around the world are amazing people 
and only recently, everybody knows about the, the stars on the wall at CIA headquarters, but there's also a very, a very small um, homage to those Iraqis, Syrians, Cubans, whoever they happen to be over the years that may have worked for us and died in the line of duty for our country mm-hmm. also have a little monument monument there. So every time you think that a country might be bad, it's not the country. There are individuals within that right. country back to that, that are it's that bad are there. apples. Exactly. There's a lot of good people that are putting Did I answer your question? So yeah, think so yeah, yeah. I'll I'll give a I'll see if I can give a now, while I'm able to talk, not, not undercover anymore, there's, yeah. of course, things that I did that I can't get into specifics. But there was this one one gentleman that uh, I knew was going to be a problem. Um, but because of his language and because of his access, we needed him. And this was the only, the only person that I wanted to stop meeting with him. And headquarters overruled me and said, thou shalt, you know, continue um, I was able to control this guy because I was the one that recruited him. I was the one that knew how he thought, but I knew as soon as I left and handed him over to the, the folks came behind me that the thing was going to unravel yeah. and unravel. It did quickly. And it had, uh, <laughs> it radiated, uh, to the place that I went to next. And of course, you know, there was almost a shutdown on that level. And I reminded them, I told you guys three years ago that this guy was going to be a problem. Yeah. Here's the documentation. Here's what you all pushing me. And nobody wanted to hear. Of course, nobody wants no to wants hear to look after the fact. Say. We needed him in the time that we needed him. And I should have said goodbye to him when um, when we left. But we decided to keep on. And he, his thing was money. Every meeting was about money. Money, 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 money. I'm like, you're starting to lose sight of what you agreed to do. If you recall... And I was there. We were the only two people in the meeting. This is what you agreed to do. And this is what I agreed to pay you for. And he just kept deviating from that. Money, more money. And yeah, money and more money. He is one of those guys. Retrading that had to is do what we call that in real estate. Re- what? Retrading the deal. Retra- retrading. retrading the deal. Oh, yeah. But you he wanted a deal. It's solid. But, but he wanted to retrade the deal every meeting and it yeah, just got well, old. I yeah, was like, you know, you got a okay. problem. Right. Exactly. When this guy leaves, right. He has all that information. Ah, he could, but those people who he was telling us about would know about it. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want the the, the Iranians or the Chinese or the Russians to know that for the last three years he's been right. That's what keeps people quiet. Right. 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 Yes. I I I almost almost said the, the collusion word because that's not what it is collaborative um and and it is an agreement between it's not an agreement between that that operative who's pitching it here's what the united states government is offering you yeah and i took wow. them i i took my commitment to them as serious as i do to the u.s tax paper taxpayer people over the years over my 28 years would ask me when they'd see me in airports around oh so who do you work for and my first question to be to them would be, do you pay your taxes? And they'd look at me askance and say, <laughs> are you with the IRS? No, 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 no. If you're a U.S. taxpayer, I work for you. That's who I work for. I don't work for the administration. I don't even work for, and of course, I never said director CIA at the time. I would always know who the secretary of state would happen to be living my cover. That's who I work for. I worked for the American taxpayer. That's who pays my salary. That's who pays my bill. And I'm telling you, that's the mentality of 90 plus percent of the people that I ever was engaged with um, within CIA or within the intelligence community writ large. Yeah. So what I've heard you say, and you've told me this before, right? the misperceptions, the TV right. you know, depictions, but overall, for right. someone who was at an elite level, you're, you don't like to use that word right, right now, it's but all, it's someone right. who's been in... Your whole life, your whole you career. You can say elite. Oh, okay. I, I, you, so, can, you can say it. I just You don't can't like say to it. say it, but right, we're right, sitting right. with an elite of the elite of the elite <laughs> right. in a small sector of people that can do what you do. And right. your view is a realistic portrayal and a realistic view. You've lived it. But your view is that a good majority of the people 
if not all, there's never all, but a good majority right. of the people you worked with in intelligence agency were good people with great values that yes. just, you know, wanted to do what everyone wanted. They wanted to have a good life for their family and wanted to protect our freedoms. And, right. And right. the depiction of that there's these evil guys that are trying to control the world and pull the pull no. the strings. It, it's just that's just BS and that's not what it really is. At all. And if I can finish the story of the young man who said, Oh, how do how can you work for these guys? Yeah. I said, well, uh, then oh, then his last question I said was so. What's the one thing that you're looking for in terms of applicants to the CIA? I said that's easy, integrity, and li I mean literally the whoop, you know the shaking of the head. It's like, but don't you guys lie, cheat, and steal? And I said yes, but never to each other, and never against U.S. interest ever. And I don't think he, I don't think he processed yeah, that. Yeah, his head blew so, up. At that point, he couldn't handle that. Listen, character, integrity, accountability are things that are the literally the driving force behind everyone at CIA. You can't have someone who is out. Listen, they put us out in places where the military doesn't go. We're in places that only thing you have are your wits and your training Almost never do you hear about anybody going rogue, rogue. like, you know, um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, consult, I'm consulting on um, uh, an MGM Skydance uh, show right now. Second season of Condor is coming up and based on the book, The Six Days of the Condor on the mm -hmm. uh, the early 70s uh, Redford movie, Three Days of the Condor. But rogue agents are are everywhere. So oh, how, how can you be a part of that? So that's entertainment. I love entertainment. I met the cast and crew of Homeland at CIA headquarters yeah. in, I don't know, uh, early, uh, early 20, 2014. And um, the, uh, the DDO, the deputy director of operations at the time, who's had been a friend and remains a friend, came to me and said, Daryl, I, I need you to do me a favor. I said, it's not a favor, boss. I work for you. What do you want? He said, I need you to uh, meet with the cast and crew of, uh, of Homeland. I was like, oh, come on. I, don't I said, honestly? He's like, yes, I'm asking. I'm like, yes, sir. You know, salute and, and did it. But I arrived to the, to the meeting late. They were in town to, I think they was the opening of season three. Brody. Um, well, it was Brody's last, last season. If you haven't hit it, I'm not going to do any spoilers. But... Um, I walk into the room and it's of course the Israeli creators, the British star Brody and other foreign nationals on the seventh floor at CIA headquarters. And the question was when I was walking in the door was how is the CIA different than it was when you joined? And so they said, well, we need someone from the DO, the director of operations to answer it. And the, literally every eye in the room turned to me I'm sure. and I'm apologizing for walking in late, not realizing that the question had been posed. And I said, this is an easy one. The fact that I'm sitting here at CIA headquarters talking to the cast and crew of a TV show about CIA, that would have never happened in 1990. So, of course, people start laughing. And I said, but on a on a on a more poignant note there was not an example of a division chief and within the CIA the div the division chief within the operational side of the house is the pentultimate that's that's the job you want none of none of the none of the division chiefs were anything but white males at that time and I became chief africa division after that the job that I was in black hispanic women, Asian, Asian women, Asian male, all now have risen to yeah. be the head of their particular director. Yeah, so much more diversity. Much, much more diversity. As the world has as, evolved. It's evolved you know, as the world has evolved. You, you can't, inclusion in diversity is more than skin color and it's more than gender. It's diversity of thought. It's the diversity of experiences. Well and whatever that diversity looks like is irrelevant. It's can you do the job or can you not? 
So I was a part of the DO's Women's Council. I was one of the few male members and the DO's uh, Black Executive Board. And I consulted with the Asian Pacific American Council, all these agency resource groups. But my message didn't change. And I was an ally for our, our internal um, uh, gay and lesbian uh, groups. My message didn't change to any of them. I don't really care what your proclivities are, what your what you what you do. Can you do the job or can you not? That's it. That's all we care about. Right. And there is a lot more thinking like that now. Yes, there's still, um, you know, mostly men running it, but mostly men are are joining. Um, listen, it's it's hard, but it's fun, and it's um, rewarding. And I would recommend anyone who's even remotely interested in the CIA is the next time they, you know, come to your school, stop by their booth. Just just listen to what they have to say, because it's not what you think it is. Just like California wasn't what I thought it was. When I moved here, I was yeah. like, eh, everything I had ever heard about California, okay, Y'all got to admit, California's move at a, just a little different pace than everybody else. And moving here was moving here for me was no different than moving to Morocco or Uganda or Pakistan. It was a completely different culture yeah. to me. Culture but the shock. people here was so open and engaging and friendly that I was like walking around, shaking my head like this is not what I expected. And so I'm just asking people to be open minded to be open minded yeah. to understand that the CIA is not even a little bit interested in tracking in what you are doing as an American citizen a because it's against the law and b because why are we interested in Americans when everything we have to do has to do with international uh international affairs yeah. who is bugging our stuff <laughs> uh apple um, Apple, Google, uh, Google, <laughs> Facebook. Um, every, so every, no, no, part of the government. no, I, I know, I know that she loves I know, conspiracy I know theory, every, Sarah. everybody wants to think that, that there's, um, they're being watched that, by, uh, that they're being watched. You are being watched. If you got a, if you have a phone that's connected to the internet, you're being watched, but you ain't being watched by your government <laughs> and that's by your service. That to me is scary. Yeah. You know, yeah. so if you were coming out of college now, I asked you this mm -hmm. off, off camera, but if you were coming off college, knowing what you know now with your life experience in the CIA, would you still be excited to join and start a career at the CIA? I would. When I when I joined, I read everything negative. I, I only wanted to read about the things that the agency really didn't want out there, but was out there at the time. Yeah. And once I read what I read and felt that if I can live with this, then I can, I can, I can do this. And I can tell you, I was never ever asked to do anything that was against my moral, my moral compass, my upbringing, or anything. Um, and that's you would just never believe that if if you base everything you know about the CIA on books, movies, and TV shows yeah, so that you've seen. Can you speak about, we talked about 9-11, but other events like Benghazi, thing that, is that something that you, what's your take on what happened or are you uh, allowed to even I, talk about it? You Listen, this. Did you even like the movie? Yeah, was the I, movie good? Well, I mean, if, if, you, if you think about the CIA guy as he was uh, depicted in that movie as being um, a bumbling idiot, then listen, we don't send, you don't send people out in front of bullets who are bumbling idiots. Okay. Yeah. You're only going to send your best people. I know the guy who was out there. I know the role. I know the person. I mean, it was probably a compilation of, 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 of multiple folks. The problem that I have with that story is it's told through the eyes of guys who know nothing about the CIA. Now they're out there supporting the CIA. They're out there protecting it. But in terms of how we execute what we do, that's not what they do. These guys are former SEALs and Delta and whole bunch, and God bless them. And I've worked with them all over the planet. But their story was slanted. And their story was absolutely didn't take into the fact 
that even if the United States had put every cent and made made Benghazi their top priority, <laughs> that's not how our government works. It would have taken a year and a half to get that building built to the the standard at, at a minimum, probably more like three to five years. It's not that easy. Yeah. And it's not easy to build something secure inside of a war zone, which is what Libya was at the time. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I didn't know Ambassador Christopher. I know people who serve with him uh, in, in, in other countries. And he paid a heavy price. He paid a heavy price. No yeah. question. Not at all. Nope. Listen, the CIA is apolitical. I know people don't want to believe that, but I don't think the FBI should be painted with the swath for those two FBI agents who are texting back and back and forth to one another about Trump. They didn't speak for the FBI. Yeah. And the CIA, I, I've worked for every, uh, the one thing about the, the current administration that, that kind of irked me and still irks me is, is make a, Make America great again. Listen, that's starting from the premise that somewhere along the way we weren't great. That and you're you're an Obama holdover. I'm like, I don't think you understand how the government works. If you're going to say that sentence, then you have to say you're a Reagan holdover, you're a Bush one holdover, you're a Clinton holdover, sure. you're a Bush two holdover, From and you're an Obama. Chain of that's presidents. right, because I worked for every president from Reagan to Trump. OK, you can't just say it's you're one. only this. I'm not only this. I yeah. don't care who's in. We don't really care whether it's Republican or a Democrat in the seat. Our job doesn't change at all. Our job is to keep this place as safe as we can keep it from the enemies that are out there. And they are vast and they're coming after us every single day, all day long. That's it. That's what we do. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's scary. <laughs> but it but it's. So I'm on the General Mattis side of that. People ask me, oh, you know, what keeps you up at night? I'm like, uh, nothing. I keep people up at night in other places. Yeah. <laughs> wondering about where I am. Wondering about what I'm going to do next. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I can say that. And, <laughs> and yeah. It was, well, it's, you heard you know, it here it's first. Not, well, you know, that... Yeah, that's that sounds a little bold. No, but, but the I bottom But the bottom line true. is, I'm telling you that... People know that the CIA is out there and you never know who's actually working for us and helping us and supporting yeah, thank us. Thank God they're out there right. keeping us safe. So FBI, CIA, I never had a bad relationship with anyone in the Bureau. That was how I was raised, to be kind, to be nice. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar, all yeah. those you know idioms that you can think of. But I can tell you that every day, CIA and FBI is talking every day. CIA and NSA is talking every day. CIA is talking to someone on the Hill, making sure that they're aware of who we are and what we're doing and how we're going about and doing it. Yeah. So this whole thing about we're hiding things from people, we're not hiding things from people. It is classified and it's a secret and it's a secret for a reason. Once the enemy knows how we're going about gathering the information that we're gathering, that goes away. It's not a secret anymore. It's not we a secret know. anymore. <laughs> it's gone. So that's a really good question. When, when something's classified, or your whole career is classified, right. who are the people that that are that have that know classified information? Is it the president and everyone um, in the CIA? Certain division, like who who would know classified information? Who so has, ev everyone everyone at CIA has. Um, so if you're in the has, CIA, has at least a secret clearance minimum, yeah. including the char force, who are the people who um, who clean and empty trash cans and oh, all wow. that, all so that. Just absolutely, even the employees, in absolutely, the office. background investigations, everything. Um, but do they have access to information? Because we operate under what we call the need to know, know principle. No. Just because you work in a in a station or a base or at headquarters and the five of us are all in the office, you're going to have access to some files that the other four of us won't. Right. So and I everybody. might have and nobody. Well, what's Danny doing? How come I can't see what Danny? So it's just well, like that's the culture. You just, you it's know. the culture. You know, you have access. to They what tell you me know, they tell me what I need to, to know. 
Yeah. They tell me what I need to know, and you you figure out by engaging but people. Does you know, other parts of government know? I mean, um, the president? Yes. Or certain- so the you know the the three core missions, the analytical side of the house, they prepare uh, documents that are being sent out to all the secretary level. Um, so that's who uh, has access. Yes, those are the ones secretary who have access. Level. Correct. So not everybody at Treasury is going to have access yeah. to what CIA is saying, but the top people who need to know to make the decisions about how we're going to engage North Korea on this right. issue or Iran on that issue or Ecuador on, you know, whatever it happens to be, all those things are out there. Got it. So it's and, a tight group of people. And I, people. I will tell you that leaks and people letting classified information out is really, really rare. For the number of people who actually have clearances, who know what they're supposed to do with it and what they're not supposed to do with it, it's a very, very small group of people who take it upon themselves, uh, the Chelsea Mannings of the world, the the Snowdens of the world. Right. Um, there was a young woman from my hometown in Augusta, Georgia, who um, faxed some classified NSA documents to a reporter, few and far between. Um, I'd say that the, the folks honor, honor their oath, honor their commitment and, and, and kind of being a person who can talk about it now and walking a fine line between trying to give really concrete examples, because I tell people, you can ask me anything. And if I can tell you, I will try to tell you, but I, it seems like I'm dissembling or it seems like I'm trying to hide something. What I'm doing is making sure that if Washington if Washington is listening to this, they're like, oh, you we got Daryl, <laughs> we got Daryl on this point, yeah, of course. or that's when he was, and you know, I'm a general, and yeah. the generals are a little different than you know the folks who are not flag officers. So I have other restrictions that are on me, but Washington is aware. I'm now an ABC News correspondent um, yeah. or contributor, not correspondent, and. Um, uh, and again, I said I was working with uh, MGM on on a show. I'm also in the process of creating uh, some characters and content with um, with a couple of writers. Uh, we have an angel investor, and hopefully, I'm going to be able to get out some stories that that depict the CIA that I knew. Yeah. That go That's beyond nice. you know the 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 born bond kind of approach to things where people can people can recognize that. You know what? Guess what? Your husbands and fathers and you have elder care issues and you have child care issues and you have all the same things. We're a microcosm of our nation all the human uh, writ large. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's cool. not being shown. So I want to tell good human interest stories with a twist of espionage. That's fun. So if these ever come to fruition, if they ever make it to, to air, if you're looking for, you know, that. That, that bond or that born experience. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be that. It's going to be more more cerebral, more intellectual, more human interest, more social justice, all those things that I, I believe that. I believe let's, in let's and, and, and fight let's for. Let's get it going, Netflix. Well, Come on. Yeah, well, you, you, you know the world. It's, yeah. it's slow, and I'm not, I'm not trying to cut through anybody, any yeah. lines or anything. Yeah. I will pay whatever dues I need to pay. But I know that I have stories to tell. That, Absolutely, that people, your stories need that to be people, told. Um, and again, they're not even my stories. And I'm trying to write a book right now. Listen, writing is exhausting. <laughs> I, I thought writing writers were writing is exhausting. <laughs> I mental exhaustion is uh, worse than physical exhaustion, and writing is so mentally draining that. It's it's humbling. I've been writing. More exhausting. I've been writing since September of October, and I don't think I have a, a single chapter that I would even come where close to being. Come on, some, But only because, <laughs> only because, it have to be entertaining. You know, these yeah. are these are my stories, and I want to tell them in a way that's going to be uh, respectful to the other people because you don't course, you're not yeah. operating in a vacuum. You know, because uh, I didn't I didn't realize that me talking about my career was going to have a possible impact 
on other members in my family who also knew that I was undercover. Well, why are you talking about that now? It's been 28 years. Why Why now? Why now? Why now? I said, well, because I can and because I think it's important for people to see the CIA that I saw. Yeah. I'm not asking to change anybody's hearts or mind. Yeah. I'm not, you know, the hardcore people who are never going to believe anything that I have to say. God bless you. Godspeed. Good <laughs> luck to you. I want to talk to those people who are truly interested in learning about what it means to be a professional within the intelligence community. Yeah. And it is a profession. It is a calling. It is, um, it's not just a job. It is 24 seven. When you are representing the United States government at an embassy abroad, every single day, you are that you are, you are the face of America. And that's very, very serious for me. Meaning you can't be the ugly American. You yeah. can't be, that person, oh my God, here, there's Americans sitting at that table. You want to be respectful. Yeah. You want to um, acknowledge that, uh, as my French teacher used to say, and my middle name's Maurice, so I always said Maurice, like, Maurice, French is not English in another language. <laughs> and because um, I would always have to translate in my head, yeah. and she's like, stop thinking that way. And <laughs> it's not. And, America, you know, when you go when you go abroad, experience the culture that you're in. Don't go to McDonald's. You got McDonald's anywhere you can go in the world. Go to a yeah, place right. and, and go somewhere. Stuff that <laughs> go, go somewhere and eat something. And oh, I'm not sure I would ever. I'm not going to eat that goat. Goat is fantastic, oh, by the way. Let's go get some goat. Goat is fantastic. Um. Anyway. So I think you are uh, an ideal ambassador. For, so I think it's phenomenal that that's something that you're trying to shine light on. I think it's right. important for intelligence agencies, military. I know I talked to Josh LaBelle about this. Right. Stuff, to, to shine light <laughs> right. on, look, America, this is who's keeping us safe and who's putting right. their lives on the line. Let's not ignore them. Let's honor them as we should. And I, I think it's fabulous that I think you're just like the ideal person, and they're just and we're just to go good, out there normal and, people and trying to educate right the rest of us on what what's really going on. So life after CIA for you seems like there's going to be a lot of media entertainment, yes. right? Public speaking. It sounds like you're going to be a, a you're, you're a very outgoing social right. guy. So it seems like you're kind of tailor made for that to be well, I, to I be the face of the brand. Well, <laughs> thank you, and I appreciate it. And I'm pursuing some of my other passions. Uh, I work with a nonprofit called yeah, tell us a little a bit about nonprofit that. Nonprofit called Peace for Kids. And the foster system, no matter where you are, it's imperfect. And I believe there are thirty five thousand children in LA County in the uh, foster, in the foster care foster system. system. Um, so my my daughter, who's a a uh, a social worker in Chicago, was visiting in December of two thousand and fifteen. He says, So dad you said when you retired, you were going to, you know, you were going to start doing some things, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing? I, this was before I retired. Um, but anyway, so I told her about all the things that I had looked up and I went on for about two or three minutes. And she said, oh, so you really haven't done anything yet. I'm like, oh, kiddo. All right. So a month later, I was um, I went to the orientation for Peace for Kids and it was love at first sight. Uh, it's now celebrating, just celebrated 20 years. I was elected to the board uh, in, in March. And a part of my reason reasoning for staying in Southern California was that the youth in this program means so much to me that I couldn't be that person who said they were going to be there. And then three years later, they're gone. I don't have to move every two to three years anymore. Yeah. Um, and some of these youth Beautiful. are now in college and they've been in the program since they were four years old. They have that rock every Saturday of knowing that if Danny says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. If Daryl says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. Yeah, I'm so not going to be that guy who yeah. say, yeah, I'm going to be there until you're no longer important to me. And then I'm just going to I'm going to flit off. So um, Peace for Kids is really important to me. Um I'm 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 working on a number of small projects. I do due diligence for firms out of New York and, and other stuff. But I work for me and I take the jobs that that I want to 
that I want to take. And I have the luxury of being able to do that. You know, 32 years working for the government, nobody's getting rich, not even re interested in being rich. I just need to be able to look out my apartment and see the ocean waves roll in <laughs> and, and I'm happy. And of course, the weather here is fantastic. Um, the people that I've met, literally, I would put up at the top of the, the best of the folks. You mentioned Josh LaBelle. Love that guy. Great guy. Love his Great wife. Family. Love yeah. his kids. Likewise. And he is he's adopted me and I've adopted him. Well, like attracts and, like too. Right. You you exactly. attract good right. people to yourself. I, and so you I are. certainly hope so. Who you my are. Parents, well, I don't know. My if parents everyone, would appreciate that. If everyone in this room and listening knows how remarkable and lucky we are to have you here. And uh, I know as friends it's more casual banter, but this is a pretty unusual remarkable experience to be able to sit down and have you share what you can share. And these are some things that most people in their life would never hear, hear about. And, um, God, keep doing what you're doing. You're, you open door policy, obviously anytime you want. Okay. And, uh, hopefully we'll do some business stuff together. I know we've been talking about doing some right. interesting international I, stuff. I, my eyes and ears are open. And I, 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 it's okay if you get rich, I'll be happy if you get rich. I, hey, if I can help you get listen, there. I, I, <laughs> So that's okay too. <laughs> so I would, I would, um, I'm, I'm kind of testing the waters on this one, but I would always open up all my leadership speeches with a Latin phrase and is non sibi said patriae, not for self, but for country. Well, Amazing. guess what? I'm, I don't know if there's a literal, uh, equivalency, but, uh, not for country anymore, but for self. There you go. I am not against making money. I am not Nothing against getting wealthy um, as long as I maintain, you know, Be my you are, being who I am. There's sure. nothing wrong with wealth and there, yeah. and people shouldn't be made to feel of ashamed not. of it. Um, and I'm telling you, uh, my girlfriend is a CASA, which is a court appointed special advocate um, that works with foster youth. So she went. You know, we joined Peace for Kids together, and of course, she had to do a step. Uh, she went deeper, a step, a step even deeper. <laughs> um, and the amount of people out there of means are high net worth individuals who are giving back to causes. Uh, it's pretty astounding, and they do it quietly. Yeah, they don't. A lot of anonymous they don't giving. want right. They don't need anybody to say, "Oh, wow, look at what you did. You done good." They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And so I've been in rooms with literally thousands of people and you know every single one of them is a volunteer and every single one of them is doing it because that's what they believe in. It's one of the causes that they support. Yeah. And could could people do more? Everybody could always do more. But don't don't knock those people who have worked for what they've for what they've earned and might not always be, you know, saying, wow, look at, look at me and look at what I've done. They want to do it because it's the right thing to do. And they're out there. Absolutely. And well, don't alienate them. From the bottom of my heart, for my family, my friends, like thank you for your service. And I really keeping appreciate us safe. This. Thank you and your friends and colleagues who I've never met, but right. I, I know they're out there keeping us safe. You, you every probably day. met some. You just I'm didn't, sure you didn't I met even some. Know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm meeting a lot of them. At any time, I'm happy to meet them, whether I know I'm meeting them or not. It, it, I'm so grateful. Yeah, and I know a lot of us. Uh, not just in this room, a lot of us are grateful. And I, I hope the community and our culture can shine more light on the good work and the right. unbelievable service that people like you and your colleagues are doing your whole lives for us. So anything else you want to add before we get out of here? Yeah, I just got a uh, an excellent honor to, to be a speaker at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Awesome. On the 12th of February of 2020. Um, this came about because I did uh, for ABC News. I was in in New York and Washington, and a couple of their their Washington based folks said, "Hey, have you seen the new Spy Museum?" I said, "Yeah, I've been to the Spy Museum." Like, no, 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 the new one. I said, "Nope, haven't been there." So they connected up with a private tour. I went, um, and it's a really fascinating building. Of course, that's my line of work. So there was other other aspects that were interesting and seeing, you know, former CIA guys up on the screens and talking. And now I'm going to have that honor. Um, it's uh, an incredible honor. I, 
Yeah. So I'm speaking to, it's a speaker series. I'm one of uh, multiple speakers in their February series. So on Lincoln's birthday, which is actually his real birthday, I don't know when they're celebrating it, but the 12th of February, 2020, I would be at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Okay. And then also doing a podcast. And they're trying to set up something where I might be able to pipe in to, um, because they have a, a, a children focused uh, aspect to their to their outreach, so I might be speaking to uh, school age kids, um, adults in a in a setting of theater amphitheater type, and then also doing a podcast, and that's well, that February of next year. Very interesting. So don't miss the speaker series at the new spy museum washington dc february 12th spy museum let's get our tickets let's all get out there all right thanks thanks joe thank you Man, I cannot thank Daryl enough. I mean, that is such an incredible, rare opportunity to sit down with somebody like that who's seen what he's seen, who's done what he's done. I mean, guys, come on. that That's ridiculous. So, Daryl, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. We appreciate your service. Daryl is now leading his life after retirement. There's a lot of interest in his life story uh, from Hollywood and other things, as you can imagine. So he's being chased chased down for movies and TV and other media. If you want to reach Daryl, uh, you can reach him now. He's Daryl M. Blocker on LinkedIn. You can also always ping me at Danny Brown LA on Instagram. Uh, D Brown at compass.com. Anytime I can always put you in touch. So if you need to reach him, you can reach us first and we can, we can get him, uh, get in touch for you. But Daryl, thank you for your service. Thank you for your wisdom. We appreciate you sharing that with us. We know that was only the tip of the iceberg, but the rest of it, we're going to have to talk offline. Enjoy. <laughs>